Welcome to Click Connect. I'm your host, Craig. I am so excited today. We've got a good friend. He was on Friday Night Audit, and he still agreed to be on this show. Good friend, author, Mr. Sean Worker. Now, Danny's going to bring up a graphic of his book. If you haven't bought that yet, definitely do that. Stay tuned during the show. There will be a link for where you can order it. So with that done, I would also like to thank our production partner, our good friends over at Red Roof Franchising. Call Matt Hostetler over there if you're looking for a new brand. They're a great alternative. They've got a soft brand, an extended stay, a new proto dual dual branded prototype, and you know they're well known for their economy brands as well. Let Matt know that producer Danny and I sent you. They'd love to hear from you. So with that all done, I would like to welcome Mr. Sean Worker, author, The Adapters Platform, and so much more. We're talking hospitality, other businesses, all kinds of stuff today. Sean, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm not too sure I can I can even remotely sit in the same room with this energy that's coming <laughs> up right now, Craig. And this seems pretty tame as a, in comparison to Friday Night Audit, so I, I'm shocked. Well, I, I, I don't drink during this show, just the other one. <laughs> so <laughs> this yeah. is all natural. That, that's, that's, <laughs> that's even more disturbing. <laughs> yes, it is, my friend. Sean, would you Good please tell you. the audience about yourself and the Adapters platform, please? Well, we're, we're talking from just outside Dublin in Ireland. Uh, so that, that may be a turnoff for everybody, but at least I'm over here. So, uh, you know, the short version is... 25 plus years in the hospitality business. So well grounded in that from literally all the roles, but chunks in running sales organizations, development, and then multi-unit ops, and then other stuff and other categories of, of real estate, which I think we're going to talk about today. Um, and then obviously we thank you. You were so kind to promote the book, which, you know, clearly Glenn Hausman was all in the middle of that too. And, uh, you know, the adapters is about taking the stuff where we're encouraging, particularly the travel tourism and hospitality space to look over the fence at other industries for inspiration on how they're doing things and when they're doing yeah. it. That's one category. Two is uh, we try and take the strategy plans and the business plans of businesses and actually make sense of them and how to communicate and actually execute on those in organizations. And finally, we love talking about adaption and innovation and, and workplace and other parts in, in our sister company and inside out where we connect employees inside the company. So it's, it's a, it's, um, it's narrow, but, but it has a lot of births. I love it. And, you know, now I'm hoping that at some point in time, either when I'm over there or it comes magically in the mail, I want an autographed copy of the book. Um, now, it, I, it, I have, it may come magically through Irish Post, you know, so you never know. Exactly, exactly, you know, and and I, I you, your your book. I mean, I've gotten parts of it from Glenn, so I'm sorry that I haven't read the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, everything that I see in there, it, it is just so right on target, especially with coming out of the post-pandemic and the work models changing, which I have thought they've had to change for a long time. Anyhow, with the advent of the, of the digital nomad, I mean, producer Danny's a digital nomad. Um, she doesn't have to be in the studio with me to, to run everything. So, you know, th there's... There's a lot of good things there. So would you tell the audience more about your book, please? I'm going to start with Bill Gross. So Bill Gross, okay. you may or may not have heard of everybody out there, but, you know, a serial VC entrepreneur. And uh, it's all about timing in many respects. And that timing is where 42% of startups uh, is, is a product they probably produced too early because it's all about timing. So 40% 40 of startups is all about the timing, not necessarily the perfect product. And that's what we bring to this conversation through the book. And the book is ahead of its time, I think. And it's ironic that it's coming into its moment, which is even more bizarre. But we did speak about the convergence and we are in the fourth age of change and, and we have reached that. The intervals of change are, are so much faster than they've ever been. And then that's causing tension in the workforce. It's causing tension in how to adapt 
the business to deal with the problems that are out there, like workforce challenges, like 19% of of uh, real estate in the US is now vacant, which is up nearly 180 basis points since the pandemic. And then you've got a whole changing workforce and the confusion that's out there. And a chunk of the book was actually about emotional intelligence and workplace intelligence. And it's interesting how that has come into being. So uh, wide open for questions. Here we go. Well, let, well let's talk about workplace, workplace intelligence. intelligence. You know, what, you know, what, are, you what are you seeing there? there? I think it's about perspective, Craig. You know, when you look at where we are, there's, you know, optimism is being tempered. Yeah. We have unprecedented yeah. pace, innovation, and progress is fast and furious. We've got, you know, there's this now anticipation of a problem. 40 plus percent, for nearly 49% of the democracies out there in, in the known world are having elections this year. That's right, causing right. tension shorter terms of ter intervals of change that is really causing anxiety about what is my job? Where do I work? The tension in the workplace, like, can you imagine the tension in a hotel, for example, between the sales teams able to work from home and the chef can't, you know, unless that's been done by AI. So in, in yep, short, yep. there's this low, low buzz, that's going through the workforces and equally the employers are having problems as well understanding how to deal with this and we could dig into some of those and then the tech infusion and confusion about how to take advantage of the workplace and i got to tell you our space in generally in hospitality and if you go beyond that it's still lagging behind in efficiency and applying you know five six-year-old technologies that still haven't been deployed to counter our check-in times. I'll have to tell you a story about that in a minute. Sean, I'd love to hear that story if you wouldn't mind sharing that with us. Okay. So we've been around the hotel business a while. Yeah. And, and so I'm in two places. I was in Belfast and I was in, in Milan over the last 10 days. One was a keynote and the other was a recharge workshop. Great hotels. Both hotels, great. So I, I, before I even went to these things, I, I said, let me go back and look and see what the average check-in time was in 2010. And according to my friends at ChatGBT, it was 15 minutes. Interesting. So guess how long it took me to check in? 10 minutes. We've had a really? massive 10 minutes. Wow. I, I registered online. I got yeah. great communication through the chat bots. I got great communication through the stream workflow. And I gave all my details, and sure enough, I had to stand in line to get the key in both cases. Cases, okay. We haven't moved on at all in some respects on the basics. So this workforce yeah. challenge that we're facing is largely about efficiency. It's about experiences because nowadays we're expected to give an experience. Right. But we're not, right. we seem to be only talking about the guests. We're not talking about the people that are working there. What is a... So the question is, what is an experience for an employee? What is an experience for a traveler? And what's an experience for an investor? They all want different elements, right. but it's more horizontal than it was vertical before. And uh, I hope we adjust faster to that. We're going to need to. I mean, not, not only you know, just for the sake of the guests, but for the associate on site. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, I don't know how many hotels I've walked into and I've seen the lunchroom, okay, and the offices, and they're underground and in a basement and no windows and, and all that. Mm -hmm. And I, one of my first jobs, I worked at a, in, a, in a, for a company that we had space inside the Hall of Records in Los Angeles County, and there was no windows. I felt like I was a mole person. Um, you know, and, and it's not a pleasant way to, to, to spend any off time or, you know, if you're sitting, if you're a DOS and you're sitting in the hotel and you've got no windows, no contact with the outside world, it's not really pleasant. So those, those workplace scenarios need to change. We need to, you know, when we're developing, we've got the space, possibly an existing building, maybe a conversion if the footplate's right for office to hotel. Uh, or hotel enhanced mixed use, um, you've 
got to be able to give them some air, some space, some light, and and a, and a few other things. And I've got to figure that's got to be one of the things up on the list that associates are looking for is a better work environment. Is that what you're 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 seeing out there, Sean? Maybe I'm going to answer your question or have a go at this conversation a little bit in more indirect. You know, you ask yourself as an investor, right? We've all yeah. done this. Uh, what do I need from the asset? Well, we might have MPV returns or cash on cash returns, or we have whatever the criteria is and the whole periods may be different. Yeah. But it would be really interesting to ask more simple questions says, what does it take to have an outstanding workforce? And what are the criteria that we need to put in place to drive the efficiency of the asset holistically rather than symptoms? Oh, you know, we didn't have the windows. Well, that's bad planning somewhere along the line or the owner didn't care about the environment for the people yeah. that are actually going to drive the investment. So realigning this, Craig, is critical where we are because guess what? Thanks to the pandemic, you know, one of the outcomes for our teams is they were, and the people that work in travel, tourism and hospitality, they were heavily recruited because yeah. they were able to deal with people problems. We have people skills. Yeah. So now they've discovered retail. They've discovered airlines, aviation. They've discovered let's go on a cruise ship. So that narrow base that's basically followed building to building or I worked for, you know, four seasons and then I moved again for every two years and marry at another three years. People, you, you know, even the recruitment of GMs is getting very difficult because they're not moving. Yeah. So, you know, we the, the focus is alignment to the outcome, which is the investment thesis. But in the middle is the traveler. We're all about the traveler and we're not about the person that creates the traveler and right. creates that experience and drives value. And, you know, when you look at the results uh, from Hilton and Marriott, I mean, they're up, you know, 15 from 15 percent um, margins to a gross operating profit to 2021. 20, in the other cases, it's a growth from 17 to 26. Right. Uh, you know, you got to hold that. But where are we focusing on what does it mean to work there and what's the experience? I agree with you. And, you know, we've also done a very poor job of recruiting for hospitality as an industry and a lifetime career. Um, you know, I, I, I think in years past, we haven't promoted people fast enough. They were good at one or two things and we kept them there. I know that an industry that I was in for majority of my career was that way. Um, you know, and, and I, I personally, Professionally, I have felt for a very long time that the workplace scenario needs to change. Um, I think you're seeing a lot of things, you know, in Europe that hopefully migrate over here and some of the things that we've got here that aren't so good don't migrate over to Europe. Uh, so the workplace for hospitality and maybe some of the other businesses you know, you'd mentioned that, you know, office space, you know, that, that whole dynamic has changed. I don't care if it's JP Morgan Chase or somebody else, you know, I, I believe in being able to work remotely. I don't think they need the square footage that they had. You do have certain people that are pounding their fist and they want the workers back in the office. Um, I don't think you need to be there. You know, if you're a DOS, do you need to be on site every day? I don't think so. Um, you know, if, if you're processing, you know, items for a company, you know, I don't think you need to be in the office if you can do that all online. I don't think there's really, I think there's a lot of evidence proving that people are working remotely very well. What are, what are you seeing out there? What, you, what, what are your opinions on that? So rather than my opinions, here's a couple of facts. I was okay. literally, you know, when, when I was in Milan and we were, it was about resilience and it was about um, adaption and innovation and coupling those up. But just before I went out there, Gallup released again, another survey, but it talks specifically to what you just asked, Craig, which is, you know, what are the, what, what's the disconnects? So here's some sobering stats. One in two managers at the middle management level don't actually know this was Gallup one in two, 50% of the managers weren't too sure the direction of the company. 
where they fit in. What's in it for me and how do I contribute? And that wasn't clear. And then imagine this, 69% of the workforce is disengaged. Now that goes across a number of industries, but we're not that different. Disengaged. So I, I, I don't know about you, but that if I was an investor or a GM or a regional yeah. vice president, I'd be going, I'm, you can hear the voices now. I can hear them right now, uh, yeah. but that's not my place. That's not yeah. my place. Yeah. Well, I wonder if we, we, you know, when you go to the workplace and you're talking about, you know, the office space, I think of the office space in a different way about our, our industry. You know, that's part of, we're part of that. Yeah. So if offices are at, you know, like San Francisco, it's 35% vacancy, 19% vacancy throughout the US. It's not dissimilar to here in Europe, very similar. Now the 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 micro economies are being affected because the office workers are, you know, okay. now working from home and they're not buying the sandwich and they're not having an extra meeting in the hotel. So I just wonder when you look at office space and you compare that to the vacancy spaces that are in maybe some of the larger downtown hotels with a lot of meeting space, maybe their occupancy looks good, but it, what what are they doing about managing their space completely differently? Because with that volume of office space being empty, they're not having meetings downtown at the same rate. Right. So what are they doing about it? And then your second component was, why not have the DOS at home? Well, the, the, the sales folks fall into the special eight. There's eight categories that typically work from home and you know them all. It's the IT people, it's the project managers, it's the lawyers, it's it's the white collar worker with skills that can pick up the phone. Right. But a, another big influencer of this that we've discovered is that most of the managers that manage hybrid haven't been trained to manage hybrid. And I'll give you an example. Uh, one of the current trends, and this goes for, this is very general, okay? I'm sure it wouldn't happen in the hospitality space. It's the other industries. Is that if they're not project, you know, just say you have a task, like I have to make 25 phone calls and I got to get to my conversion and I need to improve occupancy by 3%. And let's say there's a project in there. Uh, you know, sadly, the managers don't know how to, you know, sadly, our managers don't necessarily know what software to use to prove that people are working what they should be doing. Right. So people right. are actually now in ghosting by getting their stuff done on Tuesday, but submitting it on Friday and saying, yeah, I've, I got all my stuff done. And, you know, so that there's this type of management of time. Now you could equally ar argue that, uh, Hey, I got my stuff done on Tuesday. What's wrong with that? Right. Well, the problem right. is we lost two and a half days of productivity because the manager didn't know how to actually use that software. So let's go back to the, the ecosystem. Um, we're, we're in travel and hospitality. It's all about making people connect and yep. come stay with us and have a great experience. And the middle managers, I, I, I tell you, if there's one big weak spot that we have, and you and I both know, you walk into a hotel or you walk into a restaurant, you can tell in minutes if that place is run well because of the leader. Yeah. You can, you can smell it. You can see, you can see if the staff are looking at you and the place is smelling right and it's clean. And yep. there's a great doorman who doesn't need to be told to go over and say, Hey, Craig, it's great to see you again. Right. That's priceless. Right. And yeah. then the GM that's more concerned about being in the room in the back doing whatever they do. And I've been a GM, you know, you, you have to be with the people setting the tone, but the middle managers and, and these, Leaders of the businesses are just under so much pressure. They're getting pulled from the, the investor. They're getting pulled from the employees. They're getting pulled from the guests. And I wonder how we're taking care of those that make things happen. You know, it, I, I don't think we're taking very good care of them right now. And I, I agree with you. I mean, I, I walk, every hotel I walk into, I, and I love being in a lobby, okay? I don't care if there's five people or 500 people in that lobby. You know, it's five stories or 500 mm -hmm. different stories. Um, and I've got a vivid imagination, so, you know, I, I enjoy lobbies. But I look at the staff and, you know, I say hi to every associate that I come across. And, you know, if they're looking down and mumbling hello, I know that, okay, this place is not run well at all. You know, it's, if, if they're looking you in the eye and they're smiling and they say hello, 
Uh, and if they recognize you because you've been there a few times before, say destination resort, um, you know, that's even better. And you're feeling really good about the money you're going to spend there. And, you know, it's, it, it is that, that warm welcome, that hello, good to see you again. And, you know, I, I, when I worked for publicly held corporate America, I probably went through more receptionists than anybody else in our company, because that was always the first contact with clients, business associates, uh, investors, you name it. And if they didn't get that smile and warmth across the phone or when they walked in the doors of the office, that, that person was gone. It, it was just like, no, you, your job is to smile. Your job is to make everybody who comes across you on the phone know that they are the most important person to you for that moment and when they come in the door. Um, you know, and I think we've lost a little bit of that. And I think I like remote working. Every time I was in the office, I felt like I was just doing like 20, 30 questions with the team, which was good. But in the back of my head, I always going, okay, I've got to get to my emails. I got to get to this. I got to get to that. So then I'd head out yeah, of my yeah. office and go to a, a hotel lobby and go work. So, I, you know, I think the remote working is great, but I also think you need to create more of a hybrid right now with being in the office a couple of days a week or four days a month, something like that, you know. What what do you what are you seeing on the remote working and being in the office, creating that hybrid for for the associates? So it's two classes. So we got we got some clashes here, right? Yeah. So we have we have five generations that are in the workforce right now. We could have an alpha, a Z, a millennial, an Xer, and a boomer. So when you look at that and you slice that up. Everybody's got different ideas of what work from home does from the, for them. One, so first of all, it's easy to get somebody to work from home because they're really easy to identify. But is the business ready to support them? And that's another big feedback issue. You know, are you going to help me with the internet? Do I get a stipend for my office setup? Um, what, what are the conditions about your monitoring of me? And what's in it for me? If I'm doing more work at home, allegedly, uh, then should I be rewarded differently? And the most important part that we're seeing is that, that the poor managers aren't being, they're, they're tr trying to have a, a schizophrenic lifestyle, right? They, the managers may not be working from home, but what they are doing, they're trying to manage a workforce that is not visible to them, which takes a lot more work. And then they have a physical workforce that they're inside the plant, if you will, in the manufacturing plant, in the environment. And that's that's added stress over the last two and a half years as technology has come in, convergence of jobs, right? We've lived through the, uh, the convergence of financial and accounting groups, sales and marketing. Um, it's hard to do that in a kitchen. But these convergence are multi-unit centralized groups that are now non-centralized because they're working from home, like yield managers, revenue managers. And, and that's going into retail the same way, buyers, uh, yep. logistics helpers, et cetera. So I, I think the core thing here, Craig, is who is managing, but also informing and helping the managers adjust to be able to carry these burdens, which is a lot more time to manage, inspire, connect, because we can easily go to the receptionist. That's yeah. that's right there, or the person at the front desk or the doorman. That's that's very clear. But I think the underlying thing is you are you reap what you sow. And yeah. in, the, in an environment like this, it's harder to get GMs. And GMs are the backbone of any industry, the, the store manager, the restaurant manager, the retail yep. manager, the hotel manager. And I, I wonder if we could hear more about that. And then the regional, the regionals that are multi-unit to bring the culture together. And then I think finally, the, the thing I'd say is, is when are we getting to push hard to free up the time for the people and give the tech the task work? Now, I know a lot of places have already done this. Yeah. But, you know, this intense focus on let's take away these tasks, like all the check in stuff should be done remotely, a menu, menu configuration, all of this other stuff that goes on, these examples that are out there yeah. so that we can give back time to the humans to talk to the humans. 
I agree with you. And you know what? Uh, uh, something you said earlier, when you've got all these various groups in there, boomers and Gen X and millennials and everything else, we're still doing, okay, I, I'm at the tail end of the boomers. And when I started work. And you look great, by the way. You look great. <laughs> no, no, I'm just old now. But, you know, <laughs> when I first started working and uh, I was always told by the generations ahead of me that yeah. you guys don't know anything. You're lazy. You're not this. You're not that. And we're still passing that load of rubbish down on the next generation. And that needs to change. So one last question before we hit the lightning round, my friend. What will tomorrow's workplace look like? I, I, I think in our space, tomorrow may be defined as the next two years. Yeah. And we, we, have the ability, we actually have an advantage. The fact that others have done it ahead of us, all we can do is then learn from what they've done, their mistakes, and enhance it. So the workplace of tomorrow is exactly what you just said, which is, is there's five durations and each require a, a distinct form of communication, engagement, and the ability to feel like I did a good job and I know what's in it for me and I know how I made a contribution. And if we can get there plus AI yeah. to take the tasks away from the humans so the humans can talk to the humans, that's tomorrow. Love it. Love it. All right, Sean, are you ready to play our lightning round? I'm terrified, actually. <laughs> That's okay. We don't bite. Don't worry about that. Producer <laughs> Danny's going to put two minutes on the clock, starting right, here we go. now. Favorite sport? Cycling. Cycling. Racing. Yep. Movie or play? Movie. Favorite band, group, duo, or solo artist? Uh, the Water Boys. Nice. Social media. Uh, LinkedIn, and I run away from Instagram. <laughs> Aisle or window seat? Oh, I'm a window guy. Streaming or cable? Streaming. Hotel lobby. Like as in hotel lobby where? Favorite or? What do you think? Just first thing pops in your head. You like them, hate them, favorite hotel lobby, physical being, whatever. Yeah, uh, hotel lobby, empty and uh, empty. Okay. Best restaurant in Dublin? Uh, Dada. Favorite vacation location? Uh, that's two. Uh, Iceland and uh, Malaga. There you go. You did that with 46 <laughs> seconds left. Congratulations, hey. Sean. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you don't win anything, but congratulations. <laughs> yeah, I didn't go over. That's the main thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, my You've friend, had some really great questions. My God, you dug in. Thank you. Oh, it's I love this. This is great. I We want to have you back again uh, later in the year. I, I, I think this is so invaluable. And producer Danny's going to drop that graphic in again right now. Get Sean's book, and you're really going to learn from it. And, Sean, you're a guest speaker, and you're an advisor. Uh, time for a shameless plug. How can people get a hold of you? Uh, you know, it's 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 really easy. Go on LinkedIn, and there's only one Sean worker on there, so I thank you for that. So that, that'll be fine. Just DM me. I greatly appreciate it, and thank you for the plug. Oh, Sean, thank you for joining us today and being a part of the conversation. I look forward to having you on next time. And who knows, may see you in Dublin a little later this year. I'm banking on it. I am banking on it. I am warning the authorities, by the way. <laughs> yeah, you know, I don't think I'm in their files anymore. It's been a while since I've been there. So, <laughs> oh, my friend, thank you. Have a great afternoon. Oh, it's a pleasure. It. Thanks again, Craig. Thank you, our audience. What a great episode. Get Sean Worker's book. Um, you know, we're going to have him back. And I want to thank our production partner, Red Roof Franchising. You know, give Matt Hostetler a call. You're looking for a new brand. They're a great alternative for you. Let him know the producer Danny and I sent you. And don't forget about the 7th Annual California Lodging Investment Conference. 
March 6th and 7th at the West and South Coast Plaza Hotel. Join us. We're talking about California hotels, the hotel market, brands, lenders, brokers, owners, management companies, third-party professionals, and so much more. It's a great event. Come join us. You can register at cliconference.com. And I want to thank you again for joining us today. And as I'm fond of saying, be kind, share your knowledge. Now go be amazing.